doing ZPC? Yes. Can we all stand together? We've been singing this song for quite some time now, and so I think it's time that we uh, maybe put the onus on you all to sing this chorus with us. It's called The Cost. I'll count up the cost to follow Jesus. Welcome to ZPC. We are so glad that you are here today. We want to say a special welcome to those of you who are joining us by live stream. If you would take a moment now to let us know that you are here by scanning the QR code found either in your bulletin or on the backs of the chairs here in the sanctuary. We would like to, to thank you so much for 
your generosity in giving. <laughs> so thanks to your generosity, we are able to provide discipleship opportunities for ZP Sears in addition to also providing support to local and worldwide missions and ministries. So thank you, thank you. One of those being Rise Against Hunger, which will happen on September 25th, Saturday. Thank you for providing the resources so we can do this great event and send meals around the world. So you can use the QR code to either give online or you can also, if you're in person, drop off a check in the box at the back, back of the sanctuary. Next, I would like to tell you about an upcoming Saturday seminar that's called Pace of Grace Gathering. So this will take place on October 2nd from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And our speaker will be Alan Fadling, who is the author of Unhurried Grace that Pastor Jerry referenced in his sermons prior to his sabbatical. So we hope that you will plan to join us for that great event. You can register online for that. Lunch will be provided. And finally, there's a congregational meeting on Sunday, September 12th, following the 11 a.m. service. And the purpose of that meeting is to vote on the slated ZPC deacons and elders. You'll find more information about that in the bulletin. Let us now worship together. Thank you, Jane. We're going to read uh, a few passages together, but before we do so, um, I just want to kind of invite us into thinking about the gospel. And we hear that word a lot, and we talked about it last week. Sam Spencer preached on it not being the gospel plus, but the gospel alone and we hear more about it today, but I think all of us, if we were to give answer to the question, what is the gospel, I think our answers would probably vary a little bit. And I would love to give you a perfect summary of the gospel, but I don't think I can, and I'm not sure that's the purpose, but what I would love for us to do is I'd love for us to stand, because we're gonna read some scriptures together. Before we do so, I wanna read this this text from, uh, this quote from a contemporary from N.T. Wright, it says, the gospel is the announcement that everything has changed in the coming of Jesus, and it leads us to a new kind of living. It is a kingdom of God lifestyle with allegiance to a king as the ultimate restorer. And so I want us to read together from Isaiah and from Titus and from Galatians together, Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that in Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Hallelujah. Waking or 
sleeping, your presence, my life. You are my wisdom. Give me to 
Good morning. Shall we pray together, please? Holy and merciful God, we come to you this morning lifting our songs of praise, our prayer, and our heart before you. We praise you for this new day and our part in it. We pray that our worship of you so fill our lives that we might reveal you in all that we say and in all that we do to a world that longs to see. Our God, you are love, living and moving through all of creation. You are light, challenging and purifying our hearts. You are peace deep and unfathomable, working through and beyond all of our pain and conflict. We praise you for the gift of life itself. We praise you for our fragile and beautiful world. We praise you for the riches and variety of your creatures, your peoples and culture. We praise you for human love and laughter. We long to be a source of your goodness and life, Jesus. Use us as channels of blessing to those in need. For victims of disaster and famine, we pray to you today, especially for the people of Haiti in this devastating time. For victims of war, politics, and power, we especially pray for all people in Afghanistan today. For all those who are victims of hatred and prejudice and injustice around the world, we pray. For the lonely, for the widowed, for those that feel depressed and those that feel they have no hope. We lift all these souls before you to your loving care. We thank you for the immense mystery of your presence amid the suffering of this world. Give us eyes to see that we may be witness to your living presence, that we may become your love. We remember in prayer this morning those in our community, and we pray for healing for Karen Elliott, Marilyn Jarrett, Alan Quick, Wanda Baker, and Patty Martin Brown. Risen Christ, shine on us and those for whom we pray with your eyes of compassion and mercy let your light flood the darkness in us and in our world 
and make us bearers of your healing and generous forgiveness to all people. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray together to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing in that beautiful prayer. Thank you, Jason and worship team, for leading us. And we are glad to be here. So if you're wondering who we are, I am Scott, and you are? Last time I checked, I'm Stan, I think. That's right, yeah. And, and we always are asking one another, is this, what is this that it's we're doing? It's the Scott and Stan show, Moments with s and s we're not sure. So, yeah, it's, it's Scott and Stan, I well, think, Stan and doing Scott. It. Well, yeah. And we've been, we've been doing, doing it, it, yeah, for a year and a half. Uh, so if you, if you don't watch, but on the emails that go out weekly to ZPC, uh, since the pandemic get, begin, began, Stan and I have been filming uh, Stan and Scott shows with going over the, the message that is going to be preached on Sunday morning. So we pre-taped that, and, uh, and we're excited to be doing that. And we thought it would be fun to do that on Sunday morning as well. So not just on a, a Thursday when we've usually been filming over here or in the chapel and different places, so... And we didn't ask you whether you thought this might be fun or not. But yeah, no, we didn't. We, but, but, but we, we do just, have fun. And, we do and have you fun. you and I have talked about that. Um, but I think it's deeper than that, Scott. It is deeper, yeah. We, we, we delight in one another, I really Absolutely, think. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we delight in, in getting into the Scriptures and knowing that there's life when we do that. But just to, to, to be together in that. And uh, I was thinking the other day, um, it was about six years ago, we had just returned here from 20 years in the Boston area and had begun just attending, and you invited me out to lunch. Good. Simple yeah. little gesture. You didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know where it was going to go. Yeah. But we've had much time together. Absolutely. We, we're in a, a, a pastor's group, that a small pastor's group that meets monthly. We've done that about five and a half yeah, years. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. So anyway, yeah, it's... It's more than just our having fun. But that said, we, we do try to have fun, and we now are still working with Grace Dangerous. Yes, we are. With our a sermon series, Grace Dangerous, we're doing that. We're going through the New Testament in a year, and so that's very important as well. Uh, Stan, before we dive into that, I wanted Please. to say two things. Uh, first, welcome again to the live stream at 9.30. We are glad you're with us if you're watching us from home or if you're watching us on recording uh, in the next hours ahead. And secondly, I did want to highlight again something that Lisa mentioned in the prayer. Uh, certainly, we've seen the tragedy in Haiti, and there is ways that you can help with that. We have a specific ministry that is in Haiti called Foundation Mom Prince Thomas. You can give money to them. That is a, it's a worthy uh, ministry. They're actually doing sending some medical care to places where their earthquake hit. And then we've also used several times the Presbyterian Disaster Relief, which is through our denomination. And, and, and so they really do... Very good they do work. Great work. I've been able so. to be a part of some of those teams, and Thank they're, you, they're remarkable. Yeah, so we want to just let you know that those are ways, specific ways that you can help here as a ZBC here. Stan, thanks for being our parish associate. If you don't know, Stan's a parish associate. It means he is, in, in a sense, a volunteer pastor. He's not on staff, but uh, Stan does a lot for us as ZBC, so thank you. And you're probably uh, glad I'm not. No, <laughs> well, I know. I'd, I'd, I'd love it if you were on staff. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> no. All right. So we're in Grace Dangerous, um, and Stan, today we're going to be talking about freedom, two words, yep. uh, or two themes, freedom and athletics, or athletes, two of those themes. As we look at then 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I have a question for you. Okay. As you think of athletes or athletic competition, what would you say is the greatest? Who are your, the greatest athletes? Who are the greatest athletes? All right. Well... I might change from time to time, but I think currently I would say uh, track and field athletes, probably especially sprinters and swimmers, uh, okay. phenomenal. From watching the Olympics here at the end of July, uh, love it, incredible 
athletic capabilities. Oh, and they are. I was thinking of the, the platform divers. And yeah. I, uh, the same kind of thing. Yeah. So but if you were to ask me. I am, and Stan, yeah. so who do <laughs> oh, you think? Oh, thank you. Okay. Who do you think are the greatest athletes? Uh, I would say those who perform ballet. Okay. All right. Not that I've ever seen much ballet in my life, but, but there are those occasions when we w would see the Nutcracker. Uh -huh, um, sure. But I, you know, there's, I find that remarkable, what they're able to do and able to do with, with music. Now, I know that's very closely related to gymnastics, and so uh -huh. a similar kind of thing. Yeah. But even basketball players, I would put, basketball in, players. In, put up in that, that category. Again, the movement, um, the twisting, which is well beyond me. It was yes. always well beyond me, and I never... But so, yeah, that's, that's where I would go. With yeah, that. and I would like basketball players as well. I'm a fan. I thought you would. I'm a fan I of that. I thought you would. All right. Well, good. Before we begin today diving into the Scripture, and we are going to do Scripture, we're going to dive into that, something we do on our videos and something we're doing today. Uh, let me open us in prayer for this time. Let us pray. Mm. O oh Lord, our God, may the words of my mouth and Stan's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts bring honor and glory to you during these minutes together. God, today, may you illuminate the word. May mm. you show it to us. May you teach us your word yeah. so that we may be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to read the scripture as well. We're in 1 Corinthians as we were last week when Samantha Spencer was our guest preacher. We're today skipping ahead over to chapter 9, and it's verses 19 through 27. That's going to be up on the screen. I'm going to read the first part. Stan will read the second part. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. And then Paul gives us an illustration as we read further in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And we are thankful for God's word today, and we will try to learn from it. So when we typically do a Stan and Scott video, one of the things we do is try to do kind of an overview of the book, so 1 Corinthians uh, as well, and then we kind of put that in context and then go over the passage. So Stan's going to walk us through uh, the book. First of all, though, I wanted to say a word about Corinth. Uh, last week, Samantha Spencer, as we said, did a great job of kind of leading us into 1 Corinthians. And Corinth was an ancient place 2,000 years ago that was worldly, intellectual, and cosmopolitan, kind of one of the great cities of that part of the ancient world. There's a couple of pictures of some ancient ruins of Corinth of what still remains there. So this very cosmopolitan uh, city stand and really kind of leads us to a more contemporary Very kind of so. letter. Yeah, whenever I read this letter, it just sounds daily, and I think it has that quality to us. Last, last week, Samantha reminded us very well that uh, in writing to the Corinthians, Paul, in his estimation, was writing to a body of believers who had all the spiritual gifts. They had it all. But 
They were a horribly fractured and fragmented body of believers. Um, party spirit was very much their theme song, I yeah. think. And so Paul, then in, still in chapter 1, laid the foundation as he sought then to address that issue in their life together. And so he spoke of the cross mm -hmm. as foolishness, as the foolishness of God, if you will, but also then the wisdom of God. And Scott, as you and I have heard many times over the years, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Hmm. We're all broken, we're all sinful, we all have flaws, and there's no room for boasting right. when we take seriously the cross. And so Paul starts with, with that theme and then begins to move his way, chapter 5 and 6, he highlights some of their problems. They have incest within the church. They're taking one another to, to court, suing one another. And probably the deeper problem is they're proud of it. Hmm. They're proud that they're able to do these kinds of things. Then in chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, he then notes this little phrase, now concerning, and he uses that then for the remainder of the, the letter, verses, or chapter 7 to 16. Now concerning. Apparently, he had written the Corinthians a previous letter to which mm -hmm. they responded, and in their response, they had some questions. And now he's seeking to answer those questions. So, they had questions about marriage, about singleness, about whether to eat meat offered to idols. They had questions about spiritual gifts, which then led him to, uh, in the middle of that, chapter 13, the love chapter. Mm -hmm. and, and Brendan, I think, next week will be sharing with us from that chapter. Right. Yep. And then there was a final question about a love offering, a monetary offering to the saints in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They were experiencing famine. And so that's, that's kind of our, our overview of, yeah. of the letter. But our intent this morning is to, be, to look at 1 Corinthians yeah. 9. And, and it's, a great, it's a great book which does dive into such, such issues which are contemporary as, as well for today. In chapter 9, as we kind of, as we kind of uh, talked about earlier, it talks about freedom and then athletes. How do they train? What is their discipline? So first of all, we're going to look at verses 19 through 23, and here's a, a short outline on the screens for you. Paul was a slave to all. He says he wanted to be a slave to all. What he means by that, he says to the Jew under the law, I'm going to be like a Jew. Now, Paul was a Jew. He was a very well-trained Jew. He was a very intelligent man, and he, he still wanted to be able to go to the synagogue as a Jewish man and be able to debate in the synagogue. He said to the Gentile outside the law, because they're not under the Jewish law, he wanted to relate to them where they were. He was a Roman citizen as well, but he wanted to relate to them in the ways that they could understand as Gentiles, as non-Jewish people. He even says, to the weak, he became weak. I could picture Paul thinking about as he travels around kind of the Middle East as what would be modern-day Turkey and modern-day Greece, as he travels around to these towns and cities, seeing people that maybe are on the margins that Jesus would see that were weak. He says, to the weak, I become weak in order to relate to them. So Paul says, I have become all things to all people to win some or to save some. That that is what Paul is trying to do. So, so Stan, I think it's, it's a great example. Paul is really, um, he really changes kind of maybe the things he says, how he relates to people in order to bring them the gospel. Now, we've talked about, Stan, that there's a, a big criticism of Paul uh, from this passage, right. is that perhaps here he is, he's even changing the message. Maybe, he is, uh, maybe he's watering down the message in order to try to win believers but as we've studied some and discussed, Paul was not a chameleon or a compromiser, but really an ambassador. He was an ambassador representing the kingdom of God or representing uh, Jesus. So not a, not a chameleon or a compromiser, but an ambassador. And not if I could, at all. Yeah, if I could say a word about being an ambassador. An ambassador represents his or her country 
to another country. So imagine a U.S. ambassador going to a foreign nation. They retain who they are, as Paul would retain who he is in Christ, and yet they're going to be free uh, to be a slave, in a sense, to change uh, maybe their message. So they're going to learn the context. They're going to learn... Um, they're going to learn the culture. They're going to learn what the people are about in order to shape what they say and who they are to meet the people where they are, to relate to them where they are. And so I imagine that's really what Paul is doing here. He, he tried to understand and identify with other people, their hopes and fears, their joys and struggles, in order that he might share the love of Christ, the gospel of Christ. I, I agree fully with you. He was not a chameleon. He was not a glad hander. He was not a, a crowd pleaser as such. Um, but he did try to communicate with all. But as we read a little earlier, Paul understood that he was always under a law. It wasn't the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, but I really think the law that he was under was, and he called it the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. I think it is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And so as Paul related to whether it was those coming out of the Hebrew Jewish background or to those who Gentile or to those who were weak, what motivated him was love. Yeah. Genuine love for the other. And then to move into the world of that other. Now, what has come to my mind, and it, I, I don't mean to be offensive, and it may be somewhat of a crude analogy, but if Paul were to relate to someone who was a drug addict, he wasn't going to become a drug addict right. to enter into that person's world. But my guess is that he would then begin to recognize that he had his own addictions. Mm. That is, he was addicted to pride. He was addicted to self-righteousness. Uh, he, he was addicted to being judgmental. He was addicted to being a sinner. Right. And so I think he began to, could understand where another person might be coming from. Yes, yeah, Stan, we've, we've said, as we looked at Romans, we are all sinners in need of a savior. And so Paul could relate to people in that sense. Very much so, yeah. very much so. And I, I think that, uh, well, in your early years of ministry, and certainly in my early years of ministry, uh, we were familiar with that language, uh, incarnational, my language was theology. Yeah, Yours incarnational was ministry. ministry. Stan, I think your early years of ministry were before my early years yeah, of ministry. Yeah, I'm older, so that, that, that okay. takes care of that. Right. That explains that. But, but it, it's, and, and of course, we were working with high school. I should yes. say, of course, but we were working yeah. with high school students. And, and the, the thought was that you enter into that student's world in order to earn the right to be heard. Mm-hmm. And I think that's exactly what Paul was doing. He was entering into the world of that other in order then to live and then to share what he felt and knew to be really his heartbeat, his, his right. life. Um, and so that, that thought of incarnational theology uh, as we read a little while ago, it, it's the same language. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win the many. Yeah, exactly. So Paul was doing that, and uh, he was trying to reach everyone that he could by being a slave uh, to Christ and a slave to all to win people for Christ in their context, in their culture, relating to them where they were. And very much living what he said. I mean, that's yeah. the beauty of Jesus' life. What Jesus said is what he did. What he did is what he said. And I think what we talked about is that Paul really gives us a high calling. Uh, yes. Paul, Paul challenges us. And I, I've heard people say they don't always like Paul's writings. I think one of the reasons is he, he pushes the envelope. <laughs> and I think here again, this is a challenge. It's the grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. But the dangerous part is if we fully live it, we are, in a sense, saying, I'm going to be enslaved to Christ so that I might live like him and live for him. So it's yeah. not just your words, but it is your, 
your whole life. Which leads us to the second part of this passage, which is in verses 24 through 27, where Paul talks about athletes, and he uses this example in these last uh, four verses or so. And so, Stan, I didn't get pictures of yours because I was working on pictures of mine, but we do have some photos of some athletes here. And if you were like our family, we watched a lot of the Olympics the last two weeks of July, just a month ago. Here's some of the sprinters. I think it's in the 100-meter final there in Tokyo. And then the next one, I think the 200-meter final, um, these runners were incredibly fast. The announcers were saying in the Olympic sprinters, Olympic sprinters can run up to 27 miles an hour. Imagine driving your car 27 miles an hour and someone's sprinting alongside of you. <laughs> Uh, almost superhuman speed that they run with. Maybe my favorite athlete from the Olympics was Katie Ledecky, was a swimmer. And so uh, this, the swimming athletes are amazing. Now, Katie Ledecky is the most decorated uh, American women swimmer of all time. She's won seven gold medals and several other medals as well. So we really enjoyed their incredible, their discipline, their perseverance, their speed, their, their artistry, I think, as you said, like gymnasts or divers. Uh, amazing. So at eight o'clock, we also had an example of someone who shows incredible discipline and athletics and what they do. So I was talking this morning, uh, right before the eight o'clock service to Mike Robertson, if you know Mike and Jill Robertson. And I said, Mike, I think you were doing this huge bike ride. Have you, have you done that? He's like, yeah, I just got back yesterday. All right, tell me about it. I remember reading an email about it. Tell me about your bike ride. He said, yeah, we left, in Pu- we left from Puget Sound, Washington, and we rode to New Hampshire, uh, 34 days, an average of 112 miles a day, with some days up to 140 miles a day, and they completed it, and he got back yesterday. And he was here walking at church at 7.45 this morning, so I was very, very impressed uh, with that. So people who do, uh, who do athletics, who do them well at a very high level show incredible discipline and excellence and perseverance and training. And this is the kind of thing that Paul talks about, which also relates to being trained and disciplined for the gospel. So up on the screen, we see Paul talk about that he was also an athlete. He uses the word I, he speaks in the first person, first person that if I'm a runner, I'm, I wanna run to win. If I'm a boxer, I don't just beat the air, I'm gonna train to be a boxer. He mentions that. He says, what does he wanna do? He wants to win an imperishable wreath. Back at that time, uh, they would talk about in the Greek times, they would want to win a wreath. It was a laurel, the ones with the, the leaves that would go around it that you might see. And these athletes that wanted to win these wreaths, they wanted to not be disqualified. Uh, Paul would say he trained in order not to be disqualified from sharing the gospel. He wanted to train and be disciplined so he could share the gospel, I think, with authenticity. The word athlete comes from the Greek word agonizo. Did I say that correctly? Oh, you're, do, you're doing okay, it. Okay, so I've been practicing and, a lot And I with know that. that some of these folks really want to yeah, so practice with you. Yeah, so if you hang out with Stan, Stan's going to talk to you about the Greek. There's a little secret. Stan oftentimes reads the New Testament in the Greek. He just skips the English. He just reads it in the Greek. That's actually true. So uh, agonizo, let's say that on three. Let's say that together. One, two, three. Agonizo. See, you've, you've learned some Greek today. There you go. That means an athlete. Now, you're rubbing off on, no, I'm rubbing, rubbing off on You're rubbing off on me. Your, your, yeah, the Greek. You can hear in there the word agony, the word agony. So a person who's uh, engaged in a contest or a contestant might have agony because of their very hard training. So. Or there is that language that often is in the locker room, no pain. No gain. No pain, no gain. Yeah. And I told Stan when he said this other day, no pain, no pain for me. So that's, yeah. I, I played golf this week. I finished 18 holes. I felt really good about that. And Were then I worked a- in the yard for an hour yesterday. How about that? Oh, well, that's so. good. Were you a swimmer? No, no, no. I was not a swimmer. You were so. a basketball player. I, I played basketball many, many moons ago, decades ago. All right. But athletes competed, they were contestants in a competition in order to win the prize, to crown, be crowned with the wreath or the garland of victory. And there's two kinds of crowns. Or there are. Stand. There's the, the one Greek word, Stephanos, which we then get the, the name Stephen. Um, but that's the wreath. That's the laurel wreath. The other one is, comes to us in English as the word diadem. Mm-hmm. And that would then be your, your crown, your metal crown with, set with gems. Yeah. So, but this is, this is the wreath. Um, the, the laurel wreath that, I don't know, are you... Later going to talk about Revelation? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll bring that up. I won't. I'll okay. let you talk about that. 
But I think, anyway, this is yes, Stephanos. This is, this is the wreath. Talk a little bit about what that, uh, the word there means. The athlete will, according to Paul, exercise what? I think that's uh, where you're up. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm off track now. Okay, right? right. Okay, that's a problem. Yes, Paul then recognizes that the athlete is one who's to be very focused. Whatever his or her motivation, there is this one goal, this one focus to, to achieve. And he uses not only the word then agonizo, but then he uses another Greek word, which we won't try to play with, but enkrateia. And that word literally means to power in or to hold in, or if you will, to master. And so what Paul is talking about here is that, that the athlete or the believer is one that, that really needs to discipline, to, to focus, to hold in, to master. Uh, this idea that, that the, the believer then in mastering is going to do this with great freedom. Freedom whereby it's true with the athlete. The athlete says no, no to this, no to that, but yes, finally, to, to one thing, to win the prize, to win the wreath. And so Paul is now using that as, as to help us as those who believe to, mm -hmm. to say, well, what's, what's the goal? Mm -hmm. What's the prize? Right. And he talks about it as one specific goal or one specific prize. So yes. for a track athlete, it could be the 100 meter, the 200 meter, the 400 meter, the pole vault, the hurdles, or the long jump. But really, at the highest level, they've got to choose an event, an area where they can really focus. And Paul, in the same way, freely enslaved himself, or we could say for us, we could freely enslave uh, herself or himself to one event. For Paul, it was that imagery of to share the gospel. That was his one goal. Now, Katie Ledecky is a swimmer. She mostly swims uh, uh, long events, but she focuses on swimming. And so I was reading an interview with her and finding out a little bit more about her uh, just this weekend. And the interviewer said, this, this is the interview she just did in the last two weeks. They said, what is your secret? What is your secret to your excellence? And Katie Ledecky says, well, everyone's always trying to find out what the secret is, but there really isn't any secret. It's just a lot of hard work over many, many years, not just from myself, but from my coaches, my teammates, my family, everyone that's helped me to get to this point. It's not just the 15 minutes that I'm in the 1500 meter race. It's hours and hours every week for five years back to the last Olympics in Rio and also the many years before that. That's the end of her quote. A couple of things there, Stan. Number one, one of the reasons I like her is her humility. She kind of deflects praise from herself. She talks about that it's a community. Yep. And I think as Christians, we live in community. That's why part of the reason we come to church on Sunday morning is to be in community, that you can sign up to be in a home group, to sign up to be in Stan's class on Sunday morning, to have friendships, to pray for one another, that we can do this together. We're not going out there alone, even if it feels like that. So she shows humility. She talks about community. And then she mainly talks about practice. It's discipline and perseverance to get to where she wants to go. And so really, Stan, this is, this is grace dangerous. We are accepting and receiving the grace of Jesus Christ, his salvation. We're all sinners in need of a savior. And then it's dangerous, though, when we commit ourselves to really going out, to putting ourselves out there to well, serve him. I, what I find remarkable also about that quote is that she and family and that community they live for 15 minutes yeah. to put your life just in that moment of 15 minutes. I, uh, to me, that, that, that's also the, the remarkable facet of, of an athlete's life. Right. But of course, as we give thought to this passage, it, it's either paradoxical or, or certainly ironic where, where Paul really is suggesting that the believer is to freely choose slavery, um, to be free. The believer is to become a slave to the gospel, a slave to the love of Christ, a slave to Jesus. 
And, and it occurs to me that, that Paul is using that word slave. In, in the Greco-Roman world, the, the word is doulos, and that word can be translated as either servant mm -hmm. or slave. But in that world, servants, you could have been a lawyer, you could have been a doctor, you could have been an educator. Servants were slaves. Mm. And so it's very much that, that encouragement then that, that we, we are to enslave ourselves for the sake of Christ, to be free in Christ. It seems to me that the believer then must hold all things lightly, not that they're unimportant, but that for his sake we hold things lightly. For his sake, can we give up a car or a home? For his sake, can, can we forego not taking that career advancement? For his sake, can we freely enslave ourselves? Hmm. Good. You ready to move on to the next one? Okay. Can we freely associate with those who are lost or alone? Can you freely let go of a long-cherished dream to accomplish something else for Christ? Can we freely become all things to all people, maybe at least all things to one person, so that we can share the gospel of Christ? With these questions, we might answer, can I? Am I able to do that? In all likelihood, your response might be that of Jesus' first disciples who said, well, then, who then can be saved? And Jesus responded, for you it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. So let God to help you to accomplish the impossible. So for Paul, he said, for athletes, they would, or he would want to win uh, a perishable wreath. But he said, no, he doesn't want that victory wreath, that laurel wreath. Paul wants an imperishable wreath, a crown that we get with the next life, the eternal life with God. It says in Revelations 4 and 5 that we lay our crowns, those victory wreaths, at the feet of Jesus. Even then, we are still dedicated, devoted to Jesus in life with him, even being in face-to-face -face with him. Because of his love and sacrifice for us, we freely sacrifice for him. Any final thoughts? No, I think as is our pattern, we, we have questions. We have questions, and so I think you're going to get us started I on those, Stan. Can you be free to be a slave for Jesus? Mm-hmm. Can you hold all things lightly and be willing to let them go for his sake? And then third, can we discipline ourselves like athletes to be all in for Jesus? Can we discipline ourselves to be all in for Jesus? Fourth, can you develop a relationship with someone else to reach them for Christ? Can you develop a relationship? That's part of what going all in is, putting ourselves out there to be all in for Christ. And then finally, and, and as we share these questions, they're readily applicable to you and to me, certainly sure. to me. But finally then, today and the week ahead, may this be our prayer. Lord, move in me to be free, to be your slave. Lord, move in me to be free, to be your slave. All right. And with that, let us pray. Most loving God, move in us to be free, to be your slaves. Lord, to let go of the things we need to let go of, to hold the things of this world lightly, to discipline ourselves for you, to be willing to build relationships with others, to reach someone for Christ. Lord, help us to be like Paul, to look at what the context is, where we're going, who we're speaking to, in order through our words and our actions in the week ahead to represent you to someone else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. song we could ever sing 
Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We all stand together. Only there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. With your heart and lead me in your love. 
to and I will build my life and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you Sharing that. So Paul's call to us is difficult. It's challenging. And yet we know that we have the grace of Jesus, that he went there before us. We know that God loves us. God cares about us. God gives us the power. He gives us the personality. He gives us the experiences to go out and to share that with others. So may we go from this place with the love of God the Father, with the grace of Jesus the Christ, and the courage and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen.